First of all, let's talk about an accurate representation of a face. If I were to sit you down or if you were to send me a photograph and then I were to paint or draw a picture of your face in a way that faithfully represented the position and shape of your nose relative to the eyes, maybe a, uh, you know, a curl of the lip, maybe a few uh, you know, hairs of your eyebrows in a particular way that really captured you accurately, I think most people would say, okay, it's accurate. It looks a lot like the photograph or the person. And on the one hand, while that could be interesting, it's not particularly creative because it faithfully represents what's already there. In contrast, a painting or a picture like an Escher, and for those of you that aren't familiar with Eschers, involves a lot of repeating patterns. So for instance, a bird image that's repeated over and over and over and over again, sometimes in partially overlapping manner and perhaps a building that's repeated over and over and over again, or stones repeated over and over again, or staircases over and over again. Eschers capture elements from the outside world and faithfully represent them, but faithfully represent them over and over and over again, which is not typically seen in the natural world. In fact, most of what our visual system does is to eliminate repetitive patterns when we see them. In fact, most of what our visual system does is try and make us blind to repetitive patterns in our visual environment and only allow us to see things that are unusual in that visual environment. Now, this is especially true at visual scales. What I mean by that is if you were to go to the beach and lie on your towel and look down at the sand, you would start to notice that the sand is a very, very repetitive pattern. So at very small scales, and in particular at molecular scales, when you get down to the level of atoms and so forth, everything is repetitive. It's the same thing as just reproduced in different combinations over and over again. But as we move through our world, typically we're not looking down at pebbles on the ground or little grains of sand or the pattern of leaves in a particular clover or something of that sort. Most of the time we're looking out on landscapes or at people's faces, et cetera. And very seldom do we see highly repetitive patterns at that scale. So what Eschers do is they essentially reveal to us a fundamental feature about the way that our visual system works, which is that repetitive patterns tend to become noise in our visual system. That is our brain encodes re repetition as things not to be interested in and the things that stand out against that repetition as the things to be interested in, so-called signal to noise. What Eschers do is they invert the relationship between signal and noise and they make the repetitive patterns the signal and the unusual patterns the noise. In fact, in every Escher, there are unusual patterns and those completely disappear to us. Now, when you look at an Escher, what you probably see and what I see are just a bunch of birds repeated over and over again or buildings or staircases repeated over and over again. And you may like Eschers and you may not. That's not the point. Today, we're not talking about taste in particular creative acts. What we're trying to identify here are the rules and mechanisms of what constitutes something creative and why it's creative. And the key element here is that what's revealed by an Escher through these rep repetition patterns is an inversion of the way that our brain normally encodes visual images. And therefore the rule that repetition is suppressed in our visual system and that unusual visual features are revealed to us, that rule is what pops out to us when we look at an Escher. Now, when I say pops out, I don't mean that you look at an Escher and go, oh, normally I don't see repetition. Normally I see the unusual stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But there seems to be something about truly creative acts that capture the attention and sometimes the delight of many, many people is that they reveal a fundamental rule about how the brain or the world work. Let me give you a different example, also from the visual art world. Let me give you the example of Banksy. Banksy is an artist that many of you are probably familiar with and probably some of you are not familiar with. So for those of you that are not familiar with Banksy, Banksy is an artist that most often does two-dimensional artwork. So these would be stencils or paintings or drawings like many artists and does them in an urban landscape, an actual city or suburban landscape. That is, he draws or stencils or graffitis in a very cryptic way, I should say, no one really knows who Banksy is or when he does his art, he just reveals his art by putting it up. But he does this in the context of cities and on three-dimensional objects. So a good example would be he will stencil next to a phone booth, a police officer, or he will graffiti next to an actual fire hydrant, a dog lifting its leg to urinate on that fire hydrant. Now, what's interesting about Banksy's is not simply the fact that he puts two-dimensional art onto three-dimensional surfaces in the urban and suburban landscape. Because if you think about it, that's been done many, many times before. All graffiti is that. All city art and murals is that. 
So what's unique about Banksy? What's unique about Banksy, or I should say Banksy's, the actual art, is that he combines two-dimensional art with a three-dimensional landscape in a way that the concept pops out at you. What do I mean by that? Well, in the case of the dog lifting its leg to urinate on the fire hydrant, that's a scene that most people, and in fact, most children are familiar with from cartoons or from our basic understanding of the stereotype of dogs. And I must tell you, having owned a male dog, a bulldog, Costello, for many years, hydrants were a particular target for Costello. Of course, everything was a particular target for Costello urinating outdoors. Nonetheless, he liked to pee on fire hydrants. That itself is not interesting. Seeing a photograph of a dog raising its leg to pee on a fire hydrant is not interesting. Seeing a painting of that isn't interesting. Seeing an actual dog urinating on a fire hydrant isn't interesting. In fact, seeing a painting in two dimensions of a dog raising its leg to, of course it can't actually urinate, but give you the impression that it would urinate on that fire hydrant isn't particularly interesting except for the fact that it reveals to us something fundamental, which is that we tend to pair visual relationships between different objects that share a common theme, and then the theme tends to pop out us. So for instance, the dog raising its leg next to a fire hydrant, even if the dog is drawn in two dimensions and the fire hydrant is in three dimensions, allows the concept of dog and fire hydrant to emerge or pop out at us, which reveals to us something fundamental about how our brain works, which is that our brain encodes concepts and entire stories as symbols of interaction between different objects. Let me give you a different example just to make sure that this hits home. One of Banksy's more famous paintings is a rather politically charged one, which is of a girl holding a bouquet of balloons and this two-dimensional drawing was put onto the West Wall, dividing territories in the Middle East. A very controversial issue. The controversies of that issue are not what I wanna get into, but I don't think anyone would doubt that it is a controversial issue. The two-dimensional drawing of the girl with the balloons on the actual wall turns out to be quite interesting as an art piece because what it reveals to us is the entire controversy around the presence of that wall and the desire for certain people to breach that wall and the desire for other people to insist that that wall not be breached for whatever reason. Again, this is not about the particular controversy. The point is that a two-dimensional image combined with a three-dimensional structure allows the purpose of that three-dimensional structure and the controversy around that three-dimensional structure to pop out at us in a way that if, for instance, we had just seen a photograph of somebody next to that wall or with a ladder, or if we just seen a drawing of a girl holding a bouquet of balloons on a drawing of that wall to not emerge. In other words, it captures two fundamental features of the visual system, our ability to encode things in two dimensions and understand symbols, and our ability to understand things in three dimensions, and in particular, the wall as a three-dimensional object is really interesting because it's an actual physical barrier. So showing it as the actual physical barrier that it is in real space, in three dimensions, turns out to allow the interaction between those two things, the concept, the controversy to pop out at us and make us think about that particular controversy and perhaps where we each individually stand on that controversy. Now, there are many examples of what I just gave in the visual domain. For instance, uh, Rothko's, which are just color on canvas, are a particularly interesting source of information about the way that the brain encodes color. Later, I'll fill in what, exactly what that information is. You may like Rothko's, you may not, but I'll tell you one thing, when you look at a Rothko, you are seeing colors in a very different way than you would ever see colors in any other context. The fact that they don't have a frame, typically, and the fact that there's no white canvas allows the colors that you see to be novel hues of those colors that you will not see in any other context. And in doing so, reveals to you what your brain does in order to understand and extract color. Now, in the context of music, for instance, you will sometimes hear a street musician play a song, maybe a Bob Dylan song or a Led Zeppelin song or a Pink Floyd song, pretty closely, pretty accurately to the way that song is played. But of course, that's not creative. That's just like the photograph or the accurate portrait of somebody's face. Or you may hear an acoustic version of what's normally an electric guitar song or electrical song or vice versa. Somewhat 